is our state senator and Senate Majority Leader, Mike Shirky. Hi, Mike. Bart, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. Yes, Senate Majority Leader for a few more weeks. But yep. last week, according to uh, a consulting firm, Grassroots Michigan, Tuesday's election marked hands down the worst day for the Michigan GOP in modern political history. And I think you agree with that. You know, kind of depends on what your time frame is, but it's, it was a tough day. It was a tough day. And I'm going to be honest, it was uh, caught us all by surprise. I think everybody across the entire political spectrum, it caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there were uh, obviously racist people were watching, but no one was anticipating that both the Michigan Senate and the Michigan House were in danger of, of flipping. And that's what caught you and everyone by surprise. It was, what? People the next day were shocked yeah. that that happened. In the Senate, it was less than 1,000 votes, the difference between keeping majority and losing majority. We knew it was going to be tight. I mean, redistricting was not favorable to the Senate in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, to wit, all we got to do is talk about the Jackson the, the Senate district that includes Jackson, you know, the redistricting commission at the very last minute pulled a fast one on everybody and moved uh, com politically competitive from a seventh or eighth place in their priority to number one. And then they, you know, stamped the maps and where they went. And so, you know, there's hardly much communities of interest uh, aligned between, you know, most of Jackson County and Ann Arbor, you know but that's where we're tied to now. And Tim Golding did fantastic. He worked his you-know-what off and came. He outperformed all the data, uh, but just couldn't overcome, couldn't overcome the Washtenaw County and Ann Arbor um, difference. He did well, he did well. The uh, top of the slate, uh, Tudor Not Dixon. so well, no, not so well. And, and you were a big supporter of uh, Tudor Dixon, and, but, uh, for governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and attorney general, all candidates lost. Yeah. And secretary of state candidate lost big, but it was a pretty wide margin of victory. For and I'm the still a, I'm still a supporter of Tudor. I think she I think with the with the resources that she had available to her and the process she had to go through, I think she did well. Um, and every poll, and I emphasize every poll, uh, had the outcome a lot tighter than it ended up being. And so I'm starting to question now some of the reliability of, and we spent, and when I say we, I'm really talking about everybody, spent enormous amounts of money on mm -hmm. polling, and it proved, proved to be uh, inaccurate. No, mm -hmm. and I think it's an outdated concept, the way it's done. In the case of several of those gubernatorial polls, 600 voters were surveyed, 600. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, that's the way polling is done. You take uh, a fraction of the population and extrapolate. But even in one of the state's most respected polls, Tudor Dixon had a one-point lead on the morning of Election Day. I know. I know. So you got, got a question where that came from. Last week, the uh, Republican Party leadership and Tudor Dixon were exchanging barbs of blame. What? Who's? What? How, what happened? Um, I would just say this. Uh, there's a lot to blame to go around. Uh, even, lo even more lessons learned. Uh, it was a big mistake to have that fight publicly. And I've properly communicated my feelings about that, you know, to both sides. Um, we didn't have a state party this cycle. We just simply didn't have one. And you didn't ask me what the other headwinds were, but I'm going to tell you, there were four. We talked about one already, that's the redistricting. Mm -hmm. That was a headwind. Another headwind was the timing of the Supreme Court on, their Dodds, on the Dodds case. You know, why did they choose to do that in June and not after the election? There's a question in my mind that will always be in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, a, th a third element here is uh, Proposal 3. And then the fourth element is Trump. And I'm, it may be that Trump had more oversized influence in a negative way from my perspective than, than uh, what most people know. Well, all the t 
top, uh, eventually the candidates that ended up on the ballot for the Republican Party statewide were Trump supporters. And during the selection process leading up to mm -hmm. the party convention, all the candidates spent a lot of time currying the former president's favor, uh, almost as if that was their singular goal to be endorsed by Donald Trump in order to become the yeah. candidate. No, so this is a good example of, you know, people worshiping a little G God and not the one true God. And you remember, if you go back on one of your shows, I, th I think probably was in June-ish time frame, we talked about this topic and you asked the question, I mean, how do we, how do we overcome the Trump effect when it's not positive? And I said, there's only one way and that's beat him. And uh, we didn't beat him all in the, um, in the primaries but they showed what happened in the general. So I think there needs to be a, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna to uh, diss President Trump. I'm not gonna do that. I just think he's starting to prove that his true colors are not, are more aligned with his interests rather than global interests. And those who support him, I think manifest the same thing. They want a local victories. They want to have their oversized influence and they don't really care about the global effect of, uh, of, a two, of a strong two-party system, in this case, would be the Republicans. You know, so if you don't align exactly with everything they believe in, they, they jettison you. So I think that's something that we have to wrestle with because it's, otherwise, you know, the Democrats have did a very good job this time of being aligned and staying on message and staying, mm -hmm. you know. And they have a, an amazing machine, a turnout machine. And we have to learn, you know, this was to another good example of the effect of the uh, expansion of the use of absentee ballots. Um, and that not, nothing, uh, I don't think there's anything really wrong here. It's just that the way that tool is utilized by the two different parties, then we have to, we have to fix that. Well, both parties can use the two, tools <coughs> of the absentee ballot the same way. And, a, and, and the goal is that everyone has access to, to vote. Right. And so like I said, I'm not, I'm not dissing the fact that you, I don't, I think you have to, should have to file a uh, application. I think it should be signature verified. I mean, that's two things that I strongly support, but the use of absentee ballots by itself done that way, I wouldn't have any problem with it. Um, but uh, the Dems, it's based on my assessment, <clears throat> did a really good job as soon as the AV started getting sent out, they got people to vote. Mm. So what does that really mean? That means that all the money spent Campaigning from that point to the end for those who already had placed their vote was likely for naught because they're not going to, most people aren't going to go spoil their ballot and change their mind, mm -hmm. you know. And they'll, frankly, they'll, if they, once they voted, they probably turn the uh, TV off. And nobody was, nobody was going to change their mind exactly. after in the last exactly. three weeks. In fact, exactly. that's what one of the problems of Tudor Dixon is that most of her money was spent, spent in the last three or four weeks. Well, it's because all she had, that's the only time she had actually <laughs> any money. But let's not lose focus on my biggest disappointment is not, I'll lose the majority, but I'd like to be able to protect life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Proposal 3-1 with such a large margin, I think is a referendum on the values and the hearts of, uh, of the citizens of Michigan. And it doesn't bode well. It's, uh, it, it, you know, what happened was unique in history. And I think it's so unique, especially with proposal three that God said, you know what, if that's what they want, that's what they're gonna get. And his fury showed. And uh, I think now we have to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, Democrats are in control, will be in the legislature, and let's see how they respond to this new responsibility, uh, particularly with relating to putting regulations around uh, all the things that were ambiguous in Proposal 3. Uh, I put, both Sue and I put our, everything we had into defeating Proposal 3. And, it, and, uh, uh, it failed in Jackson County, Proposal 3 it did. did. It failed in all three counties that I happen to represent. Yep, and uh, you know, I think it also is an indicator of the division across our state. That's a very important social issue. And women, mostly single women, are the ones that, you know, per the data that I've been able to uh, see, are the ones that gave us such a large margin, so. Well, it's <clears> divisive <throat> across the whole country. Uh, 
and getting back to the Republican Party tomorrow. Uh, former President Trump is expected to announce that he's going to run again for president. As you say, the party needs to get past Trump. That's not going to happen if he's running for president for the next two years. Well, I, I'm going to be uh, disagree with you there. I think it, like I said back in June, I believe was the show I was on. It's time that we just take it on. You know, let him. I mean, it's free country. Go ahead and run, Mr. President. It's your, you're right. You're not going to make it because we're going to put somebody up that's better represents the the uh, the country now today. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> he's uh, he's probably somebody's going to send this to him. Now I hope he doesn't have my current cell phone number because I hope he doesn't post post that well, on. Facebook. He's given your cell phone number yeah, no. out before, I so know. he I might know. do it again. I know. Yeah, I know. And I don't, I don't hate the guy, you know, nothing like that, nothing like that. But it's just his interests are for him. Right, it's been become abundantly clear. And uh, in a, I'll tell you another uh, example of that. He was, he was pretty aggressive in endorsing candidates across the country, but he didn't hardly spend any of his money supporting them. To me, that's, that's, just, uh, that's just another indication that, you know, his, he wants to be popular, he wants to uh, be a kingmaker, but, you know, it's all about how it makes him feel and not about moving the country forward. And how in heaven's name did Pennsylvania elect Fetterman is beyond my comprehension. I mean, that one there is like, I mean, I'm changing subject a little bit, but holy mackerel, the poor guy shouldn't even been, have been running. He's, frankly, he's that sick. And uh, how people could have elected for the poor guy to, to so the United States Senate is, uh, is a mystery that I hope gets solved. Well, we've had uh, people in the Senate and in the House um, recovering from strokes, uh, surgeries, gunshots. Uh, yeah. We've had sick people in, in office uh, oh, before. Oh, sure. I think... Few of them, though, have, have had struggled to put together three sentences as well, much the, as... Well, uh, the, uh, the uh, Republicans had a lousy candidate uh, yeah. in Dr. Oz. Not, no no re, uh, argument for me on that. No <laughs> argument for me on that. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a wild ride this last uh, week or so, and now it's time to uh, really test whether or not we're prepared to, you know, rebuild. Some of the things that have <clears throat> been uh, accomplishments under your watch are being discussed as uh, there there's a, a target on the uh, the right to work, or as you call it, labor freedom. <laughs> labor freedom. Where unions are as free to make their case as you, workers are to make their choice. And no, I, there's, they've been very clear about that's on their radar screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll make another prediction. If they overcalculate and overreach and make, decide to make a move there to satisfy their union supporters, then you will see uh, investment in Michigan begin to shrink and shrink quickly. Every single survey made of those of companies and placement services of companies looking to expand and so forth, uh, the number number two or number three issue is whether the state is a labor freedom right to work state. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they if we screw that up, then investment in Michigan it's already a headwind in Michigan for other reasons. But if they if they decide to uh, you know thump their chest and uh, and repeal that law. Uh, the consequences will be dire in, with regards to invest, new investment in Michigan. That's my prediction. Another uh, hoped for uh, legislation uh, accomplishment of yours this past term was uh, the reform of uh, mental health mm -hmm. uh, delivery of services in Michigan. Right. That, that never happened. Why didn't that happen? Well, we still have time, but we got, we got feedback just this past week and the, mm -hmm. after the election. Uh, from the department saying they're not they're not interested in talking about it, meaning they're not going to make a recommendation to the governor to mm -hmm. sign it. So, it, it's uh, you know it's just, it's we've we've moved the ball a long ways, uh, but it's not going to get done this term. With lame duck, uh, it's predicted that nothing of consequence uh, will happen because of the uh, change in in uh, party control of the House and, and the Senate. Is that? It's hard case? to imagine what topics the governor would want to negotiate with 
me on, you know, between now and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there. I hope we do a, a year-end supplemental to kind of close out the books, uh, you know, from a budget standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not new spending. It's just, you know, closing, reconciling basically mm -hmm. our spending. Uh, and there's a few cats and dogs things that we might be able to get through, but I do not expect there to be, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty lame, lame duck. The well, Michigan Hospital Association is hoping uh, that the legislature will uh, allocate funding from uh, COVID relief dollars to make up uh, for losses. All, all the major systems in the state of Michigan uh, reporting losses for 2021, uh, including Henry Ford. Yeah. Over 120 yeah. million uh, loss. Will the legislature look at that? I doubt it. Mm. I doubt it. I don't think it makes a big difference between de doing something like that in December and February, you know. But we still have, we're gonna still carry over probably $6 billion of money that's unspent. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Based on um, the comments from leadership in the Republican Party last week, uh, critical of uh, Tudor Dixon, even more critical of the candidates for Secretary of State and <laughs> Attorney General, he called them uh, not quality candidates. Uh, is there uh, a future for you in Republican in the Republican Party statewide in terms of leadership? Yeah, I'd like to be part of the contemplation of what do we do next and how mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, I, I seriously doubt whether there's any role for me from an elected elected standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm still. Um, not exactly embraced by some of the, you know, the uber right grassroots folks because, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't succumb to the pressure of, you know, the it's election. The, it's the Trump yeah. uh, voters that you right. uh, right. are not being embraced by. But if the future of the Republican Party is to look past Trump, doesn't that give you uh, a little bit more of a leg to stand on? Yep, and I think we've got some great candidates to um, that are standing by, ready to ready to do that. Mm -hmm. But we have to. There, we, we need some systemic changes in the state party, mm -hmm. not just changes in leadership. We need systemic changes. We've got uh, Ron Weiser and uh, the DeVosses who seem to wield a lot of control with their money. Is it time that they get out? Well, I don't think you'll see Ron Weiser. And it's, poor, it's too bad because up until this cycle, he, you know, nobody could have labeled his legacy as anything but stellar. This cycle has tarnished it a little bit, and I feel bad for that. Uh, but I will also say that it, back when we had to pick the party chair, there weren't a lot of people standing there with their hands up saying, I'll do it, I'll do it, because they knew it was going to be a tough cycle. Um, and the, uh, the, the Well, the they knew Ron Weiser wasn't going to give it up as, as well, because there were well, plenty of calls for his uh, resignation throughout the year. Yeah, but he won. He won at a convention. So, you know, he had to have the votes, convention votes. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, those who want to diss uh, uh, some of our, f our friends on the West Side, specifically the DeVos family, I think it's so misguided and so inaccurate. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, uh, they, are, they have very true, clear, consistent value system. And they, 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 they put their money where their mouth is on that value system. Uh, and, and for the most part, Republican candidates uh, reflect that more so than uh, than some Democrats. Well, money sure plays a big role in uh, elections. We just have to look at the list. The Slotkin and Tom Barrett race, over $36 million spent on just that race alone. Well, shoot, uh, I think I think uh, Whitmer spent, on, on her behalf, close to $40 million, mm -hmm. you know. So there was all, it, it was a insane and embarrassingly large number of money, amount of money spent and it's uh, on yeah. in elections, and I don't know how to stop that. I don't know how to stop that. It'll never stop, and it won't stop because <clears> the <throat> beneficiaries, the media, <laughs> they're never going to carry any kind of uh, story that would would advance any possibility that. They so would you're lose. you're you're in media, media generally speaking, and uh, so oh, are just, you going to ask me a question? I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so so tell me, who do you think in the media even comes close to being fair? JTV. Besides JTV. Uh, By the way, I agree with you on JTV. Well, thank you. But uh, uh, what, I mean, 
local, state, or national, who do you observe as being balanced and fair? I, I have a hard time coming up with one. That includes Fox News. I don't think they're balanced and fair uh, either. So are you not going to speak? I, I, I can't think of you know, one that is completely mm -hmm. biased and uh, unfair. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and do, mean, you, do you also agree that most of them lean one direction versus another? Or one or the other. Most of them lean one direction oh, right. versus the other. Well, it's their ownership. You look at uh, the two biggest papers in the country, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, their ownership, and the Washington Post, their ownership are, uh, they're well known, uh, Democrats or Republicans, and it's Mostly, not, mostly Democrats. Yeah. Well, not in the case of the New York or the of the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal. Yeah. So, but I mean, there are some non. There are a lot of uh, organizations that are independent and but not in, and but Bridge, not in, but Bridge not, Michigan is, is but one. Bridge is one. Yeah. But not in mainstream. You know. So mm -hmm. it's it's a yeah. it's a heck it's a heck of a headwind. Yeah. You what know? are you gonna do next? What am I going to do next? Yeah. I'm going to be doing some hunting over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I am, uh, you know, going to go study my navel in Florida for a couple months, you know, and then come back and figure it out. Okay. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Our state senator and uh, Senate Majority Leader for a few more weeks, Mike Shirky.